Hey there again, friends. How are you doing? I hope that you are enjoying the reading of my favorite book, How to Eat Fried Worms. I hope that you enjoyed that fireside chat last week as we read by the fire. So today we are picking up by starting at chapter 23. Chapter 23 is labeled Admirals Nagumo and Kusaka on the Bridge of the Akega, December 6, 1941. I may have butchered that. I'm sorry if I did. It's not going to work. Look, said Joe, even if he remembers the worm while we're at Shea, he can't get one. Where's anyone going to find a worm at the Shea Stadium? Don't worry. We'll say you've won and we'll find a worm after we get home. And we keep right on stuffing him with peanuts and hot dogs and hamburgers, and with Cracker Jack, with ice cream, orange soda, gum, Mars bars. You know how he loves to eat. You ever seen him refuse anything to eat? By the time we start home, he'll be so bloated, drowsy, he'll be burping. Remember that last time when his father took us up? He was asleep by the time we hit peak skill. Your father will carry him in from the car. His mother and father will put him to bed and next morning he'll wake up and bam, it'll be too late. We've won. 15 worms in 15 days and, well, he'll have missed a day. Alan nodded his thumbnail. But what about Tom? We'll ask him along and then just not pick him up. We can tell your father and Billy that Tom's mother called and that he was sick and that his grandmother died or something just so that we don't have to bring him along with us. Mm, that's going to cost me like $8 just to buy all that food. Cracker Jack, hamburgers. Yeah, but it's going to cost you $50 if he wins. Yeah, well, oh, geez. How do I ever get into this? If my father finds out, Alan slumped on the porch steps, gazing down at his sneakers, gnawing his thumbnail. Come on, said Joe, slapping him on the shoulder. Cheer up. You haven't lost yet. Go ask your father. Chapter 24, The Twelfth Worm. You think Alan really meant it when he said he'd given up? Asked Billy turning the down the flame under the frying pan. He was cooking a toasted cheese and warm sandwich. Ew. I don't know, said Tom, looking into the refrigerator. I suppose so. He asked us to the Mets game. Say, is this chocolate pudding? Yeah, but don't you take any. It's for supper. I could just scrape a little bit off the top, and then you could tell your mother it fell out upside down on the floor by mistake, and you were getting the cheese out, so you scraped the dirty part off into the garbage. Well, said Billy doubtfully. Thomas Grout, said Billy's mother coming in the hall. I'm surprised at you. Aw, oh, Mrs. Forrester, I wouldn't really have done it. I just, well, you know, I was just talking. You know, everybody talks. My father, Billy's father, Billy, my sisters, Annie, Charlotte, Polly, who is backing out the door. Betty, Agnes, Columbus. I didn't know you had a sister named Columbus, Tom, said Billy's mother. Would you like some chocolate ice cream instead? Oh, sure, Mrs. Forrester, said Tom, relieved. He sat down at the table. It's my cousin who's named Columbus, he grinned. Columbus, Ohio. He's a capital fella, <laughs> Mrs. Forrester. For those of you who don't know, Columbus, Ohio is actually a place in Ohio. <laughs> and I believe it's the capital. And then he had to grab the edge of the table to keep from rolling off his chair laughing at his own joke. Billy looked disgusted, and his mother opened the refrigerator and just shook her head. Chapter 25, Pearl Harbor. The car slid quietly to a stop under the streetlight outside Billy's house. Shh, whispered Alan to his father. Billy's asleep. His father glanced back at Billy, snoring peacefully in the back seat. His plump cheeks were sticky with orange soda. Alan, run up to the house and tell them I'm bringing Billy in. Billy's father met them at the front door and taking Billy, whispered his thanks. Alan and his father went down the walk. Behind them, the porch light clicked off. In the backseat of the car, Joe and Alan wrestled gleefully. We did it! We won! He's never going to wake up now! Alan struggled out of Joe's grip and asked his father what time it is. Late. Almost midnight, I think. Joe pulled Alan's head down and tried to sit on it. He couldn't do it now if he, even if he woke up. How could he find and cook and eat a worm in the dark? <laughs> we've won. We've won. We've won. We've won. We've won. Chapter 26. The Guadalcanal. But 
Slumped on the bathroom stool, his mother holding his chin up while she washed his face, Billy woke up. Hold still, dear. Hold still, dear. Did you have a good time? You're certainly home late. Is this part of winning the bet? Billy's eyes blinked sleepily. He had a gnawing feeling that he had forgotten something. He hiccuped, gazing dopily down at the furry blue bath mat. <sighs> he yawned. He remembered in the morning. It couldn't be that em Bet! Bet! He hadn't won yet. There were still three to go. Fifteen! Fifteen worms in fifteen days. Today was... He jumped up. Mom, I haven't eaten my worm today. And suddenly it all came to him. The whole trip. All the candy bars. The hot dogs. The hamburgers. The popcorn. Mom? What time is it? Quick! Oh, it's about quarter to twelve. It was a trick. He snatched his pants off the floor. They were trying to make me forget. He tumbled and slid downstairs through the dining room, his shirt tail flying, yanking open the drawers in the kitchen table, snatching out the flashlight, the drawer spilling out with a clatter and a crash into the floor and slammed out the back door, the finks. He scuttled across the back towards field towards Tom's house, searching the ground with the flashlight as he went, there, darn, a stick, geez, I sure hope I can find one. He stopped. There's not going to be time to cook it. He ran on. And there's not going to be any ketchup. He stopped. I bet Tom wasn't sick at all. He ran on. The night was moonless and close, and he paused to heave over a rotten log in the high, dewy grass. Mealy bugs and scooters clambered over the stone wall into Tom's backyard, and then, all of a sudden, he was wrestling with the pup tent. Muffled grunts and thrashings. Tom! Tom, it's me, Belly! They're trying to trick us! Tom and his brother, Pete, crawled out from under the pup tent. It was a trick, panted Billy. Alan and Joe were trying to make me forget. Fifteen worms in fifteen days. If I don't eat one in the next ten minutes, Alan will say he's won and it's almost midnight. And they left me home so I wouldn't remind you? Billy nodded. Have you got a worm? We're going to have to find one. Tom dug back into the pup tent and came up with two flashlights. They zigged a zag back and forth across the lawn, bent over searching. I got one, cried Pete. Shh. I'm gonna have to eat it raw, said Billy, and he threw back his head. Wait, whispered Tom, grabbing his arm. You should do it where Alan and Joe can see you. Pete, run and get your siren out of the garage. Chapter 27, the 13th worm. Under the streetlight in front of Alan's house, Tom and Pete knelt over the siren. Billy stood beside them, the nightcrawler squirming in his fingers. Now wait until lots of lights come on all over in all of the houses, said Tom, and then chomp it down. Ready, Pete, now. The siren growled, winding slowly up until screech across the sleeping neighborhood, sending birds squawking and chirping into the air from trees and rooftops. Dogs began to bark. Windows lit up. There were confused shouts and bangs of windows slamming up. Ladies and gentlemen, shouted Tom through the dying whine of the siren. Alan Phelps and Joseph O'Hara, through their finkiness and cheating, their lies and dirty... Come on, muttered Billy, his head thrown back, dangling the worm over his open mouth. We haven't got much time. Alan Phelps and Joseph O'Hara, shouted Tom, have forced us to wake you all up so that you may now witness a ta da ta 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 the eating of the 13th worm. He dropped to his knees. The siren round slowly up to a screech. Billy dropped the crawler into his mouth and chewed furiously his eyes closed fell to his knees still chewing his face turning beet red toppled over to his side still chewing rolled and writhed about on the sidewalk clutching his stomach still chewing tom and pete kneeling by the streetlight working the screaming siren billy threw open his arms and lay on his back under the glare of the streetlight his mouth wide open ta -ra! announced Tom, springing up and pointing to Billy. The three boys ran off into the darkness, and as they went, Tom yelled, Remember Alan Phelps and Joseph O'Hara! Chapter 28. Hello, Weir. A confused murmur arose up and down the street, and suddenly a boy shouted from the Phelps house, Finks! Alan's father dragged him back from the window. Is that why you were stuffing Billy with candy and junk all day? Leave me alone. We were trying to trick him, the fink. Finks, he yelled at the top of his voice, lunging toward the window. 
quiet. His father sat him down hard in a chair. Joe peered furtively out through the fringe of the bedspread. As soon as he had heard the siren and Tom's yell, he had crawled under the bed. And that's why Billy woke the whole neighborhood up? To show you he hadn't been tricked? Yes. His father let go of Alan's pajama collar. In the doorway, Alan's mother threw up her hands and went off to the bathroom to take two aspirin. The next day, Alan and Joe trampled from the house to house in the neighborhood, knocking on each door and then reciting in chorus, Hello, we're Alan Phelps and Joseph O'Hara. We're the reason you were woken up in the middle of the night last night and we are sorry. <sighs> You'll be happy to know our parents have punished us. We can't look at television or have any dessert for a month and our allowances have been taken away for two weeks. I promise that it will never happen again. At least not in this neighborhood, muttered Joe as the last door closed behind them. And Alan, said his father at dinner that night, I don't want to hear that there have been any repetitions of this incident at Billy's or Tom's house or anywhere. Do you understand that? But we can't just let him get away with it, Mr. Phelps, called Joe from the living room where he was waiting for Alan to finish dinner. There will be no repetition of this incident or anything like it, repeated Mr. Phelps. You tried to trick Billy and lost. That will be the end of the matter. Chapter 29. You know what you are, said Alan, his nose almost touching Billy's. You're a fink. And you're another, sneered Billy through clenched teeth. And a cheating, lying, dirty, snot-nosed, cheating, lying one. And if you say two more words, said Alan, you know what? I'm going to beat your head in. <sighs> I'm right behind you, muttered Tom, peering grimly over Billy's shoulders, his fists clenched. Yeah, said Joe from behind Alan. So what? We can lick both of you with our hands tied behind our backs and paper bags overhead. You couldn't lick a flea. Yeah? Yeah. Spiffle. Whack. A thump. Somebody's choking. No fair. Thwomp. Gouge. Joe crawled off behind a tree, nose bleeding. Whomp! He's pulling hair! He's scratching! Twist! Zzz. Alan crawled, weeping from behind a bush. Thump! Whack! Dunk! Billy, it's just you and me! Where are the others? Tom and Billy untangled and sat up. Bruised, scratched, dusty, shirts torn, hair tousled. Tom's nose was bleeding. Billy's shoe would come off. Yeah! Yeah! Sassed Alan and Joe from behind the tree. Billy started to shake his fist at them and then clamber up, but then sank back. Tom panted behind him, bleary-eyed. Yeah, yeah, y'all worn out? Can't fight anymore? Alan scooped up a handful of mud and flung it at Tom and Billy. Then Joe did the same. Billy and Tom scrambled up and pelted back. Mud splattered against trees and bushes. Alan began to cry. A rock hit Billy over the eye. He sat backward in the mud, covering his head with his arms sobbing. Joe and Tom stopped throwing. Joe grabbed Alan. Come on. Tom knelt beside Billy. Let me see, Billy. Is it that bad? Take away your arms so I can see. He tried to pull Billy's arms apart. Billy wrenched away. Come on, said Tom in a scared voice. I'm going to take you home. Come on, your mother can take you to the doctor. And that, my friends, is where I will end for this afternoon. That was the end of chapter 29. I hope that you are all well. I miss you. And until we see each other again.